G'day guys and gal, Warhammer can be a pretty graphic and disturbing setting. Like, there was literally a scene in the Night Lords Omnibus where a bunch of innocent astropaths are tortured beyond belief by the Night Lords, kept alive purely through chemicals. At the moment of their death, they were literally just like slumps of melted flesh with how badly they had been messed up. A lot of them were children. But I wouldn't exactly call that horror in the traditional sense. I wasn't scared when I read it, just a bit disturbed. So it begs the question, does Warhammer 40k have true elements or stories centered around horror? Short answer is yes. I mean, the Black Library literally has a section on their website dedicated to horror short stories and novels. The long answer is this video. Before we get started, I want to thank you guys and gal. I wasn't sure how the Magical plush would go, but it was incredible to see us not only hit our three week goal within 24 hours, but blow past it entirely. Meaning I don't have to be one of those depresso expresso YouTubers who has to end up canceling my plushie because nobody wants it. You poor, poor bastards. However, just because we hit the goal doesn't mean we're done. We're currently the 19th most funded plushie, but I want to crack the top 10. We have 15 days to overtake the gay T-Rex, the lesbian T-Rex, and most powerful of all, the trans T-Rex. After those 15 days, this guy is gone forever, never coming back again. So grab him as like a cute desk companion, or you know, like a, a sturdy toy for your kids. The shield is actually supposed to come off, relax. Or as a cuddle buddy to help you forget the cravings for the warmth of a female's touch. To top it all off, if you buy a plushie and send me the receipt or confirmation email, I'll send you a custom video message just for you. Could be birthday wishes, could be a question, or could just be me talking absolute shite. It's mostly just me talking shit. So there you go, plushie and discount cameo app all in the one purchase. Today we'll go over five moments, characters, themes, or whatever from Warhammer 40k that inspires genuine horror. They won't necessarily have to come from a horror book or story. Let's get into it. The first horrifying on this list involves spiders. I'm not a fan of spiders, as I'm sure many of you are also not. So this one hits home a bit harder. In the Beckwin Saga, which is the third trilogy for the Inquisition series, we follow the perspective of a blank clone of Elizabeth Beckwin, Eisenhorn's old companion. She's in an elite society that claims it's a training ground for Inquisitors, but it's actually the opposite. As such, we gather a lot of things are wrong. Clues here and there that point towards there being a sinister force behind the entire society. Then there is the super creepy way some society members' voices crackle when they talk. It's uncovered that the people with the crackly voices have pretty overpowered abilities that allow them to project powerful forms of energy to destroy their enemies. Hey, that's pretty cool. Kinda like Dragon Ball Z. Until we discover the source of those powers. See, the society would clone a blank, train that clone, and then once they were ready, shove a big magic spider down their throat that would live inside their body, with the crackling voice being the reverb of the lungs against the spider within them. We find this out as an Empress Children Psyker kills one of the society members by forcefully extracting the spider and crushing it. The clone of Beckwin obviously feels pretty sick seeing this as the society intended to put a spider in her as well before shit went down and her true adventure began. The horror element here is the build up. We know something is wrong. We know there is something sinister going on and we think we might be just starting to figure it out. Then BAM! Fucking eight-legged freak out of nowhere! In before one of you retards eats a spider so you can try become Goku. The Necrons are a bit of a two-sided coin. On one side, we have Trezin the Infinite, acting like an immortal Ash Ketchum, exploring the galaxy, kidnapping people for a laugh, and just having an all-round good time. Then on the other side, we have legions of soulless undead robots that want to exterminate your balls, or you know, flay off your flesh and use it as a cloak. Because this coin contrasts so hard with itself, there is a debate about what type of Necrons people prefer. I reckon both are good in their own way and both have their place. The more horrifying Necrons are obviously the ones more applicable to today's video, hence the next scary moment was ironically in one of the Kane novels, novels known for being a bit more lighthearted and funny. When Kane is exploring an ice tunnel, they keep getting ambushed by these big scary insectoid things, 
Not ideal, but the real horror is when they accidentally stumble into a Necron tomb. These Necrons aren't messing about. They have flayed ones and even the incredibly rare Pariahs, which is a blank merged with a Necron chassis to create an extremely scary enemy. Like, their superpower is the fact that they are so scary. Kane realizes he has to try shut down the Necron portal that keeps teleporting enemies in, so he recruits an elite squad of stormtroopers to help him. These guys are hard as nails. They have no fear of death at all. Like when one of them dies, the rest just kind of shrug and pour out a cold one for them. On their way to the tomb, they fight some Necrons, no biggie, then flayed ones attack, killing some of them and stealing their flesh, still no biggie. However, when this elite squad is face to face with the pariahs, they all freeze in fear. Even Kane can't move as the terror of being in their presence turns his legs to stone. He is only saved because Jürgen's blankness somehow blocks their blankness. It doesn't make much sense and probably wouldn't fit into the current canon too well, but there you go. Kane escapes, but these fearless stormtroopers spend their last moments screaming, praying, pissing themselves and crying as they are torn to shreds by the Necrons. It was cool to see the Necrons in all their horrifying glory, since the last time I'd read about them was the significantly more lighthearted Infinite and Divine novel. This next one is sad, unnerving and quite horrifying. The short story, The Strange Demise of Titus Endor. Endor and the legendary Eisenhorn used to be best friends, as they were both trained by the same Inquisitor at the same time. Endor was quite the handsome, charming go-getter, whilst Eisenhorn was the reserved, quiet achiever. Their Inquisitor Master was infected with cerebral worms, which is basically Warhammer's very grimdark version of Alzheimer's. Basically, worms infest your brain and nervous system, eating away at your brain matter, causing your memories to merge and distort until eventually they eat your way out of you as you die. You can literally see the worms dancing behind someone's eyes if they have it. Eisenhorn and Endor were by their master's side until the end, at which point they both went off to have successful careers. Eventually, Endor fucks up and ruins his career and friendship with Eisenhorn, going off by himself to do lower grade Inquisitor work. This is where the short story begins. His current assignment is going after a target in a city, trying to find clues as to his whereabouts. The way the story is written is quite jarring, with sections seemingly missing, almost as if there's gaps in Endor's memory, as well as Endor himself having a strange and borderline senile thought process. He doesn't know where his assistant Inquisitor is, he acts stalkerish and creepy to a girl he meets as he tricks himself into thinking she is a clue into finding his target. It just kind of gets more and more fragmented as the story goes on. He often thinks about an experience he had younger in life, where he survived an attack by an alien beast. However, the legend goes that eventually that beast will return, no matter where he goes, to finish him off. Eventually, his assistant Inquisitor arrives after being spam called by Endor and he cracks the shits, telling Endor to stop bothering him as he is now a full Inquisitor and Endor hasn't been one for years. This upsets and confuses Endor, but he doesn't let it get him down. He continues his investigation, which by this point has all blended into a confusing mess. Sometime later, while he is watching a play as part of his investigation, his assistant Inquisitor arrives and starts apologizing to Endor, saying he had tests run on him and that they found cerebral worms in Endor's brain. He says he wishes he was there for him and can make him comfortable in his last few months. Endor brushes this off as he is too busy with his investigation. The assistant Inquisitor, who turns out to have been a full Inquisitor for years after being promoted by Endor himself, sadly leaves. Endor then realizes he is totally alone in the Opera House before he sees the monster of his past approach and puts him out of his misery. Obviously, the monster was just a metaphor and hallucination for the worms who finally ate their way out of his brain, killing him. The investigation he had been running had been solved years ago, with fragments of it merging with his current memory, creating false clues and false leads. It was a creepy, sad story to read, leaving you feel deflated especially as it speaks of Endor as a man who had so much potential and was so bright in his youth, but it all went to shit and he died a horrible death. It's theorized that by Eisenhorn and Endor being so close to their master as the worms took him, that is what infected Endor. The fact that he was paranoid about a Xeno monster hunting him the whole time helped tick this into the element of horror. Not to mention, when someone has cerebral worms, you can see them swimming around in their eyes. 
Cosmic horror is a tough one to write about. It's also kind of tough to describe. A lot of people think that the warp or that the Tyranids are cosmic horror, and they kinda are, but not really. See, we can kind of understand the warp in our own way. The Chaos Gods have pages of lore detailing their past, present, and even future. The Tyranids are also understandable, with the hive mind having been witnessed and even wounded by various events within the galaxy. But to say that Warhammer 40k doesn't have cosmic horror would be like saying transgender athletes don't have a physical advantage over people born as female. It's just incorrect. Various worlds have unexplained SCP-like entities on them, whilst the Halo Stars are a thing. The Halo Stars, for those that don't know, are a terrifying section on the border of known space. The Necron Empire within it went insane and all became flayed ones. The worlds within them are impossible to exterminatus, and the Tyranid Hive Fleet that threw through it developed a lot of problems. The best part is that Chaos doesn't even have a purchase there. It isn't a Chaos Realm. It's a Lovecraftian section of space where things that even the Chaos Gods fear reside. The galaxy has almost been destroyed by the horror of the Halo Stars, so definitely not one to fuck around with. Another bit of cosmic horror is the Well of Eternity, an anomaly within the warp that even Titsnitch is too scared to get close to. Instead, the God of Change, arguably the most powerful being in existence, has been steadily throwing greater demons into it to see what happens. Only Kairos Fate Weaver was ever able to emerge, now with severe retardation, two heads, and the ability to see the past and future simultaneously. As you can imagine, he doesn't make for very good company. I love this shit. Stuff that the Gods of Chaos and even the Tyranid Hive Mind know very little about. It opens up so many possibilities. Is there another realm where the old gods of the universe reside, locked away but leaking their influence into real space? Is this what the Rundung were, a race so powerful due to their cosmic horror that the Emperor had to let the Void Dragon fight them like a fucking legendary Pokemon? I like not knowing everything and I like there being room to let my imagination run wild in the most horrifying of ways. And finally, speaking of the Halo Stars, we have the Halo Devices. These Xeno Devices found by rogue traders within the Halo Stars seem cool, giving you immortality and superpowers. Not bad. Until we get to the side effects, and boy are there some fucking side effects. Sure, the first little while using it is good, your body is purged of all imperfections and impurities, and you can even regrow lost limbs. This is the honeymoon stage, as the device sinks into your flesh and becomes one with you. However, after only a couple of years, your mind will begin to break, your body will distort, and you'll gain a hunger for flesh. After a few decades, you will have become a literal Xeno, and not in like a cutesy Eldar way. You'll be a walking abomination who is nearly impossible to kill. It's unclear if the Xenos who made the Halo devices were total fucking assholes, or it's simply just not very compatible with humans. Regardless, these devices are horrifying. The artwork of someone who uses them is scary, and I really don't know why people use them. You get like, a year of feeling good until you become a monster. Really shit deal in my opinion. I mean like, only after a couple decades of using it, you're completely gonzo. Horror within 40k is something I vibe with hard. There are plenty more elements of it, so if this video does well, then we'll do more. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. Where only one dollar per month give access to a boatload of fun, fun stuff that you probably should not show your kid. Unlike the plushie, which you definitely should. Hit the subscribe button and hit the real subscribe button for more horrifying content. Join the Discord for more memes and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.